Hello there. Good morning and welcome to this latest live uh, episode of our Tez Vodagogy webinar series. Um, I say good morning if you're joining us from outside the UK or um, outside of Europe. Good afternoon, good evening even. Um, so this is the final episode in this current series. Um, we've had some great sessions so far. Uh, if you miss Mondays, um, really interesting one from, um, from Mark Enser on how we close the learning gap uh, in secondary. So do check out the YouTube channel or go over to tes.com forward slash bodagogy um, for previous episodes. We are going to try and um, reinvent this all after half term um, when hopefully we know a little bit more about what um, UK schools are doing in the future. Um, so if you've got any questions for today's guest, um, the lovely Gronya will be uh, manning or womaning the uh, chat function on this channel or you can go over to Tez using the hashtag uh, Tez Vodagogy and ask any questions you like. Um, so that brings me on to today's guest. Um, Jared Cooney Horvath uh, is a regular Tez contributor. He's also an educational neuroscientist uh, down in Melbourne in Australia, hence, hence the early start for us and uh, a bit of a late finish for him. So um, Jared's written extensively for Tez about the brain, memory, how um, all of that impacts learning. He's also written a uh, book, Stop Talking, Start Influencing. Um, so I will... ...yourself now, but if that's all right, I'm gonna do a screen share. Boom, there we go. Lovely stuff. Unmuted, so can you all see that? Everything's coming through? Uh, yeah. That's Perfect. great. All right. So let me kick this off. Good day, everybody. How are you all doing? Um, thank you guys. Yeah, so much for for hooking up with me uh, this early in the morning for you guys. It's five here. So I, I just um, <laughs> uh, I just finished cooking dinner. So that's kind of where I'm sitting at right now. But now I get to be here with you guys for a half hour. So for those of you um, who don't know me, my name's Jared. It's nice to meet you. Um, I was a teacher originally. So teaching is my passion. And I only came through the neuroscience stuff because I always thought when I started back, gosh, I was teaching a while ago, but I was in the decade of the brain when the brain was just really sexy and new. And I thought if I could solve the brain, man, I could solve teaching. And that's been like a 15 year journey now. And believe it or not, if you take one thing away from me, please let it be this. It's teachers are experts. Knowing about the brain, knowing about learning doesn't really tell you much about how to teach. It gives you great concepts. It gives you new insights, a new lens through which to interpret behaviors, but it doesn't ever tell you how to teach anything. So at the end of the day, don't let anything I say tell you how to teach. You are the experts when it comes to teaching. Let everything I say be considered conceptually as ideas, as new ways of understanding things in front of you. But at the end of the day, you know what you're doing. Follow your own passions, your own understanding. And if my stuff doesn't make sense to you, cool, kick me out, trust yourself. So that's just kind of my little disclaimer before we kick in. So what do I want to do with you guys today? Um, so I want to take a look at memory with you all. And what I've kind of done now, this is going to be a real quick, dirty breeze through memory. But what I'm going to do is we're going to take a look at four principles of memory that we can build up. So at the end of this, ideally, we're all going to have four little nuggets that we can use to make sense of it. So let's start. So memory. For all the language people use and all the terms they throw out there, memory is incredibly simple to understand. It's a simple three-step process. Step one, information's got to get into your brain. Step two, information's got to get stuck in there. Step three, information's got to come back out. And that's as hard as memory is. Encoding, information's got to get in, storage, it's got to get stuck, access, it's got to come back out. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through each of these three stages and we're going to learn a cool principle at each stage that can help us better understand what's going on at that level. So let's start here, encoding. Information's got to get into your brain. To begin, I'm going to play you a quick movie here. Now, all you got to do is sit back, relax, and try your best to follow the instructions of this video. So here we go.
more from the first part. waiting for a gorilla to appear. Yes, I know. That's why I picked a new video. So here's here's the interesting thing. So the color changing stall, cool, that's off to the side. A lot of people miss that, no big deal. But that basketball hoop, your eyes are going right over it as it disappears. In fact, I have a machine in my lab called an eye tracker. So I can look at where people are looking on a screen when they watch these kinds of videos. Guess where 100% of you looked as soon as that basketball hoop disappeared? Boom right at it. If you know the gorilla video, guess where 100% of people look as soon as the gorilla comes on the screen? Boom, right at it. We all look at it, but the majority of us never see it. Why? Principle number one of memory is this. We remember only what we pay attention to. So we like to think kind of everything gets in clean. It doesn't. Uh, attention, we can kind of consider as our gateway to memory. If you want to form a memory for anything, that has to pass through what we will call your attentional filter. So if you think of attention like a filter, Anything relevant gets through, anything irrelevant gets blocked. In this case, you're counting the balls being caught, that goes through, boom, your eyes look at something disappearing, but it's irrelevant to your goal. So love it or hate it, doesn't make it past your attention filter, there is no memory for it. So attention is the game when it comes to starting, making, starting to make memories. Now there's a second part to this principle. So we remember only what we pay attention to, and part two is here. Now, here's a new picture. You've never seen this picture before, so this is pure incoming information. We're encoding new information. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change something about this picture. All you, all you have to do is, as quickly as you can, point to what changes on this picture on your screen. Here we go. I'm guessing that wasn't hard at all for any of you. It's just these suns kind of appearing and disappearing. Awesome. All right, now I want to play the same game again with you. On the next slide, there's going to be another new picture you've never seen before. It'll be just like this. Brand new incoming information. It's going to flip back and forth. Every time it flips, something's going to change. Same exact game here. But tell me, what's changing in this picture? Uh-oh. If you're struggling, I'll give you a hint. It's not a small change. In fact, you might say it's a fairly mountainous change. Yes, it is that giant mountain appearing and disappearing in front of that woman's face. So wait a second, why was this so hard? Why this one, we're fine. We're all having a good old time here, but here, what was so difficult about this picture? Why do we struggle? You've probably caught it on. It's that little white flash that's hitting every time this picture changes. So go back here. We just got picture, 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 sweet. Here, every time it changes, boom, we get a flash, flash. Flash. Now that flash is doing something to us. It's somehow playing with our memory. Now, just because I love these so much, let's play again. What's changing in this picture here? Hmm. Give you a hint, it's not off around the edges. In fact, it's right in the middle of the picture. Yes, it's that giant boat appearing and disappearing. So what's going on? Why is that so difficult? So it turns out every time that white flash hits, your brain registers that as a threat or an unknown or an uncertainty. And anytime your brain registers an unknown or an unclear, the first thing it does is it dumps your incoming memory. Whatever was just coming in about the last half second of it just gets blasted. And it's a safety mechanism. This way your brain, whatever was you were doing is probably unimportant if something threatening or unknown is about to happen. So this way your brain can focus 100% on what's about to happen. And I always say that if you're like doing math and a bear comes in, you don't want to just take the time to be like, wait a second, let me just memorize this math and oh, bear. Math is unimportant, focus on the bear. So here, essentially, every time that white flash comes on, you're just wiping your memory. That's why you can't find the change. You just keep forgetting what the picture was. So principle number one, we remember only what we pay attention to and it's incredibly fragile. We are dumping incoming information all the time. And when you dump that information, when it's gone, it's gone completely. You don't form a baby memory or a half memory. There's nothing there. Now, why does this matter? Who cares? Very rarely are we going to teach class with like a strobe light in front of the kids. So who cares? Here's why it matters. I want to play a quick game with you. So now if you've got a pen and paper, you could use that, but don't worry. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You can just use your finger and, and write on your palm. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to set my timer for 10 seconds. And when I say go, you're going to have two jobs for me. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write out the first 12 letters of the alphabet as quickly as you can. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, boom. When you're done doing that, I then want you to write the first 12 numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 
Now I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to see if you can do all of that, 12 letters, then 12 numbers, or let's see how far along the process you can get. All right, so here we go. And ready, set, go. Stop. Okay. Now I'm guessing most of you did just fine. Like you either got all the way through or you got really close. You're getting up to eight, nine, 10. You're almost there. Perfect. All right. Now I want to play the same game again. So 10 seconds, 12 letters, 12 numbers, except this time, instead of writing the letters and then the numbers, I want you to jump between the two. So first I want you to write the letter A, then the number one, then the letter B, then the number two. Same thing. We're just doing 12 letters, 12 numbers. We're just jumping back and forth. 10 seconds. Let's see what happens this time. All right. And Ready, set, go. Stop. Okay. What happened that time? Now, if you're like most people, I'm guessing you didn't get anywhere near as far that second time. Like most people only make it about two thirds through. But more important, how many of you started to get a bit confused? Like it's just letters and numbers, but by the time you get up to E, all of a sudden you're like, uh-oh, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh. Why was that so hard? What just happened there? Welcome to the wonderful world of multitasking. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't do it. No human being can do it. Ladies, no human being can do it. It's not a software issue. It's not a skill issue. Like if you practice hard enough, you can make this work. It's a hardware issue. So think about it. In order to perform any task, you have to set up and access what's called oh, to start my video. Oh, is that okay? Start my video. Sorry, something just popped up on my screen. I think the camera's back on now. I, I'd be, well, I thought it'd be nice to see your face as well while we're doing this. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about Such that. Such an animated think... face. It's a shame not to see it. <laughs> Somehow the camera turned off. What are you going to do? <laughs> so anytime you multitask or choose to do a task, you have to access what's called the rule set of that task. That determines your attention filter. That determines what gets into your memory and what gets blocked out. Problem is you've only got one rule set slot in your brain, which means you can only access one attention filter at any time. If you ever wanna do two things, the best you can do, you can ever do them simultaneously, is you have to jump back and forth between them. And every time you jump, you have to take out the old filter and put in the new one. That jump takes time, about 0.2 seconds. During that time, your brain goes black. It processes nothing. You make no memories whatsoever. That's why you were just going slower and slower and slower. Every time you jump letters and numbers, you're just losing 0.2 of a second. But more importantly, every time you jump between tasks when you're multitasking, guess what else happens? White flash, white flash, white flash. Every time you jump between tasks, your brain wipes incoming information. It doesn't form a memory for it. You lose about half of a second. And this is why you started to get confused. Even though it's just letters and numbers, every time you jump, you just keep wiping your memory and you're forgetting what you were doing. So multitasking, we can't do it. It kills the incoming information and destroys our memory. You go slower, accuracy drops, and memory suffers incredibly. Why does this matter? Once kids get on a computer and start their learning, most of them make it about six minutes before they start multitasking when they're at home doing homework or whatever, and 15 when they have access to a computer or tech in class before they start multitasking. So what does this mean for us, this principle? Well, of course it means how are we ensuring we're not help forcing kids to multitask? So how are we de delivering information in a way that's not forcing them to do the impossible? But I like to think of it kind of a different way. If we know we're sitting on about 15 to 20 minutes before they're gonna start doing what they wanna do and losing their memory, we've gotta start thinking in 15 to 20 minute chunks. Okay, what am I doing to break your attention, to break your threshold, reset your attention every 15 or 20 minutes so I'm not losing you to the desire to multitask over here? Are we gonna do an activity? Are we gonna do a discussion? Are you gonna turn to your partner? Anything to reset your attention by myself another 15 minutes before you start getting that temptation to multitask and then learning's done again. For them then, this means it's just, they've gotta be highly vigilant. As teachers, we can help them in the classroom, but eventually once they get to university level, they've gotta run this machine themselves. So the more they know the dangers and the, and the problems with multitasking, that it kills learning, it kills memory, the more we can help them stay focused and start to organize their day and their study sessions accordingly. So it's short, sharp, sweet with no multitasking. You wanna learn anything, you've gotta be focused. Attention is your gateway. So that's just step number one. Information's gotta get into your brain. Now step number two, information's gotta get stuck in your brain. What can we learn here? I wanna show you a quick graph. 
So imagine you studied something tonight. Like let's say you did three hours of study tonight. I want to show you, and here's your memory for whatever you just studied. Perfect memory tonight. Congratulations. I want to show you what's going to happen to your memory over the next seven days. Check this out. Oh, by the end of tomorrow, you will have forgotten 70% of what you studied tonight. And by the end of the week, you will have forgotten another 10 to 15%. It is a sad fact of human memory that we forget 70% of everything we learn every day. But watch this. What if instead of studying three hours tonight, you just split it up and you do one hour tonight, one hour tomorrow, one hour the night after that. You're doing no more study, no more repetition. We're just breaking it up. Watch what happens to your memory now. Hey, oh, hey, go. Oh, okay. Now, all of a sudden, you get anywhere from 30 to 70% better memory, and it lasts for up to 12 months longer, all by just kind of spreading it out. Now, why? Why did we get this boost? It's no more effort on our part. What happened? There are two reasons for this boost. We'll look at the second one in a bit. The one I want to focus on is first is here. What do we do at the end of every day? We all sleep. And what does everyone do when they sleep, whether they know it or not? They dream. What we think dreaming is, is that's your, your brain consolidating your memories for that day. That's when your brain locks those memories down. Remember, information's got to get in. It's got to get stuck. It gets stuck when you sleep. So when you space your practice out over three days, you give yourself three chances to consolidate ideas, whereas before you only had one night of sleep to try and lock that information down. So principle number two, sleep isn't cute. Well, it might be cute but it is also essential. You don't sleep, you don't form memories. So for us, what this means is we've got to start thinking about spacing. When we're running review sessions, when we're exploring new material, how are we revisiting it time and time again with sleep in between so we can ensure kids have the best opportunity to lock that information down at night? And for them, this is where they've got to recognize, especially teenagers, you got to log off and start routinizing your sleep. If you're not sleeping, you're not making memories. And if you're not getting to bed till one or two because you're gaming and still waking up at six uh, to go to school every morning, I promise you by Thursday, Friday, you're not remembering anything. It's because you're just going, getting so out of whack with this system. Sleep isn't something you do to pass the time. That is a key component to the memory game, to the learning game. So that's storing. Information's got to get in. Information's got to get stuck. What can we learn here? Information's got to get out. Now with this, I want to take a quick look at what we'll call deep memories. So what makes a deep memory? What makes a lasting durable memory? What ingredient does a moment or a fact or an event have to have if you want to deeply remember it? Now you're probably thinking like we were. Our first assumption in, as researchers was this, was emotion. You get an emotional moment, boom, you get in a big memory. You get a neutral moment, boop, you get a little baby memory, cute. Now that's kind of true. But it can't actually be the whole story, because otherwise, tell me, why do you know this song? Why do we think any of us are emotionally invested in the McDonald's I'm loving it song? Like none of us go home and say, that's my jam. What about this one? Just one I see looked up number one UK jingles this morning, and that one came up. But here we go. I'm sure most of you remember that. Here's a piece of information that you have no emotion for whatsoever, yet you've got an incredibly deep memory for it. So, okay, emotion isn't the big secret. So if we assume everything then gets in about the same, our next theory was this, pure repetition. See it again, memory's gonna get bigger. See it again, memory's gonna get bigger. Just keep shoving that thing in your brain and you're gonna get a bigger, deeper memory. Now, again, that's kind of true, but it can't actually be the whole story. Otherwise, tell me, which of these coins is accurate? Now, you've seen these coins thousands of times in your life. You've put this image into your brain time and time again. So which one's accurate? If you're struggling, here, I'll put you out of your misery. It's this one here. But point is, here we've got something that we've repeated, 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 yet nobody has a deep memory for it whatsoever. So pure repetition can't be enough. It turns out when it comes to making a deep memory, we were looking in the wrong place. We were so focused on how information goes into the brain that we missed the big trick. You want a deep, lasting, accessible memory. It has very little to do with how it goes in, has everything to do with how you yank it out. Access a memory and that memory gets bigger. Access it again and that memory gets bigger. We call this recall. Your memory is constructive. Every time you access a memory, you make that memory more durable and easier to access in the future. Work it, that's where you get your deep memories. So go back, the reason why you remember radio jingles isn't because you've heard them a million times, it's because you've sung them a million times. We usually hum along and hum it whenever we step into the store. And the reason why you don't 
remember the coin isn't because you haven't put it in your brain. It's because you've never had to take that image out of your brain before. So there's no memory. So principle three, recall is key. The secret to deep, lasting, accessible memories is yanking that information out. Now, earlier we took a look at that graph when you get some sleep and your memory goes up. And I said, there are two reasons why we get this kind of boost in memory. The first was sleep and consolidation. The second you now see is here, is recall. When you study over three nights, each time you start studying, you have to recall, what was I doing last night? What was I studying? What was I working on? And that act of pulling that information back up makes the memories bigger, stronger, more likely to be consolidated that night during sleep. So that's kind of your double bonus there. Now for this recall game, what that means for us is we've got to do our best to help our kids recognize this pattern and ideally get them offline. Computers technology are really good delivery devices. They give information. Here's some videos, here's some content. Giving information is good, it's a start, but that's not what's gonna to lead to deep memory. So the more kids rely on these kind of tools to just input memories, the harder it's gonna be. We've gotta get them off doing tech, techniques, strategies, activities, that's forcing them to yank information out, access it, that's where the depth comes from. For them then, this means, okay, once they recognize this, passive review strategies, like I'm gonna reread a book chapter, I'm gonna rewatch a lecture, re-listen to a podcast, re-look at my notes. Anytime you put information in, it's not a great study strategy. It's doing very little for memory. You've got to recall. You've got to do anything you can to rip it out. Quiz yourself. Do your flashcards. Teach somebody else. Have a debate. Anything to access that information, that's where you're getting your good study in time. That's where the memory is getting uh, deeper. That's where your study time is being used effectively. Now, there's one more thing I want to teach you before we get to the Q&A. So we've been taking a look at memory. Information's got to get in, information's got to get stuck, information's got to come back out. It all kind of makes sense, but there's one last thing we got to worry about, and it's here. Now, I'm going to play a quick game with you. So this game, you've got to kind of focus. I know it's early for a lot of you, but just try your best to stick along with me. Here's how this game is going to work. You don't need a pen or paper. We can just do it in our head. It'll be fine. I'm going to read you a list of words. While I read that list of words, your job is just going to be to sit and listen. And when I'm done reading the list, I want you to spend about 15, 20 seconds just recalling as many words as you can from that list as you can remember and recall them in any order. Just start pulling those words up. Now we're going to play this game twice to give you twice the opportunity to experience what we're feeling. So we're going to start with list one. And again, so all I'm going to do list one, I'm going to read you this list of words. You just sit and listen. When I'm done, we'll spend about 15 seconds recalling as many words as you can, any order you want, just we're trying to get those memories deep. So here we go. Okay. List number one, white, dark, Cat, char, night, funeral, color, grief, blue, death, ink, bottom, coal, brown, gray. Over to you. 15 seconds, just recall as many words as you can, any order you want. Okay, and when you're ready, we're just gonna do another one. Now that you have a sense of how long the list is and stuff, now you're kind of in the groove, you get the sense of what's happening. Let's play another one. So brand new list, list number two, same thing. I'll read the list, you sit and listen. When I'm done, recall as many words as you can, any order you want. Here we go. List number two, hard, light, pillow, plush, loud, cotton, fur, touch, Fluffy, feather, furry, downy, kitten, skin, tender. Over to you. All right. Now, what I want you to do is just forget those lists, get them out of your mind, put them somewhere else, put them in the back. I wanna change gears real fast. So we're talking about memory and memory getting stored in our brain. So pop quiz, like we haven't had a chance to talk about this or explore this, but using whatever knowledge you have, where in your brain do you think your memories are stored? Like once we got them locked down, where do they get locked down? Like are they deep in the middle, maybe in the hippocampus in our memory center? Maybe they're out here on the outside. 
Turns out, we got no clue. We've been looking for these suckers for decades and we cannot find them. We've looked in cells, between cells, in the synapses and networks. Nobody has any clue where memories go. In fact, right now, our two biggest theories are memories are everywhere yet nowhere simultaneously. So they're holographic. They're in every part yet no part of your brain. And if that sounds insane, that just shows you how confused we are with this whole issue. The other one's even weirder. It says we, we store them in magnetic fields around our body and head. So they're not even in here, they're out here, whatever. Point is, we don't know where they go, but we do know this. When it comes time to recalling, to accessing a memory, there are kind of two flavors you got. The first flavor is when you remember something. So when you remember a thing, you absolutely know what happened. You can relive that moment. So for instance, I remember uh, eating two eggs with some spinach this morning up at my counter upstairs. I absolutely know what happened. I'm reliving that memory right now. I remember that. The other flavor is when you just kind of know something happened. So this is when you feel like something is, is true and it's kind of that tip of the tongue, but you can't really complete the whole memory. Like, you know, it's there, but eh. so like, I know last week I would have eaten wheat bix uh, for breakfast one of my mornings, but I can't actually tell you anything about it. Like I know it's there, but I can't access it. So we've got remember when you absolutely remember an event happening and know when it just kind of feels right. Which brings us back to our game, round two. So here's what I'm gonna do for round two of the game. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop six words up on the screen. What I want you to do is have a read of those words and in your head, I want you to decide yes or no, that word was or it wasn't on list one. So all we're thinking about is list one at this point. And if that word was on list one, do you remember it? Or do you just kind of know that it was? So here we go, we got six words, have a read. Yes or no, that word was or it wasn't on list one. And if it was, do you remember it? Or just kind of know it? All right. And when you're ready, I'm gonna put up another six words. So same exact thing, but just thinking about list two. So over here, we've got yes or no, the word was or it wasn't on list two. And if it was, do you remember it? Or do you just kind of know it? All right. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into a couple of word pairs here and we're gonna learn some interesting things about memory. So let's start here. So let's start with the words white and hard. So real quick in your mind, yes or no, was white on list one or was hard on list two or did you get at least one or the other? This is why we do two lists. So you get double the chance to experience it. So yes or no, was it or wasn't it? And if it was, do you remember it or do you just kind of know that it was? I'm guessing if we were all in a room together, most of you would remember these words. Now, why? What was unique about these words that we remember them so dang well? Turns out these were the first words on each list. Num list one started with white, list two started with hard. We call this the primacy effect. When it comes time to start learning something, human beings tend to remember and anchor on the very first thing out of the gate. How something starts is all important. This is why like all the James Bond films start with this huge action sequence that has nothing to do with the rest of the film because they know you're gonna remember that and the rest just kind of becomes noise. So primacy effect. All right, let's move now into gray and tender. So in your head, yes, gray or no, gray was on list one or tender was on list two or one or the other. And if it was, do you remember it or just kind of know it? Boom, again, if we were all together, most of you would remember these words. Why? Why do we remember these so dang well? These were the last words on each list. List one ended with gray, list two ended with tender. We call this the recency effect, so primacy effect. Human beings tend to remember and anchor on the first thing out of the gate recency effect, we also tend to remember and anchor on the last thing out of the gate. How things start and end build everything. All right, let's move now into, I think it's bird and, oh no, sorry, black and soft. So in your head again, yes or no, black was on one, or yes or no, soft was on two, one or the other. And do you remember or do you just know? Now again, if we were in a room together, most of you would remember these words. Even though I never said either the word black or the word soft, never said those words. Those words never left my lips. Now, why do most of you think I said these words? Well, what did I do to you? So if you look at list one, we start with white, we end with gray. I know you're gonna remember these words. So what was I activating? Color, your concept of color. And what did I fill the middle of the list with? Things like dark and night, cat, ink. I wanted you to think black. Same thing over here. We had hard, I start with hard, end with tender. I'm activating touch. And then I just filled the middle of the list with like feather kitten, 
uh, uh, d- d- mattress. I don't even know what the heck I said. Point is, I never said these words. I was getting you to think them. But here's the problem. Most of you didn't just think I said these words. Most of you will have remembered me saying those words. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a false memory. And that's how easy these things are. So last thing we need to recognize about memory, anytime you access a memory, so whenever you recall an event, what happens is you bring that memory out of wherever it was stored, in our brain, outside of our brain, you bring it into your conscious awareness. And when you're done thinking about it, you have to re-encode it. Anytime you access a memory, it leaves your brain. It's no longer in this system, meaning you have to take the time to put it back. But when you are thinking about that memory, you can then do anything you want to it. You can change it, tweak it, bend it, add things to it, take things out of it. And when you're changing it as you're thinking about it, when you're done thinking and you re-encode it, it goes back with all of those changes. For all intents and purposes, the old memory is dead. And whatever you just did with it, that becomes your new only memory. And you will fight to prove that it's true. If you've ever had a fight with your, your loved one where it's like, you said this. No, I didn't. I said this. No, you didn't. You said this. I swear when I say that, I said this. Who's right? You both are. You've just changed your memory in the interim and you're fighting the truth that you both are holding on to. So principle number four, memories are constantly rewritten. We like to think this game is clean, but it's not. If we're going to be using recall as a technique, we need to remember that through recalling memories, we have the ability to change them. So if we want to make sure we're not wonkily changing all of our ideas or what we've learned, we need to have some form of feedback. So a good rule of thumb is this, recall for deep memories, feedback for accurate memories. If I pull up a memory and I have nothing to bounce it against to check its accuracy, I'm gonna put it back wrong and I'm gonna believe it's true. So if you ask me what's the prince, uh, the capital of, I don't know, Germany and I say Paris and there's nothing for me to check that against, I'm gonna believe it's Paris and I'm gonna fight for that later. So if we're gonna be using recall and our students are gonna be using recall methods during their, their study or uh, revision, We have to make sure they have some sort of feedback form. So when they pull it up, they have something to check it against. They go, oh, it was right or it was wrong. And then that memory goes back accurately. So recall for deep memories, feedback for accurate memories. And there we go. That was our quick breeze through memory. And as you know, there's a ton more to do with it, but let's just quick reminder of where we've been. Principle one, we remember only what we pay attention to and it's incredibly fragile. So here we were looking at the idea of attention being everything and multitasking, destroying the ability to make memories. Principle two, sleep is essential. You lock memories down when you sleep. You don't sleep, you don't make memories, end of the game. Sleep is essential. Principle three, recall is key. The secret to deep memories has very little to do with how it goes in, everything to do with how you pull it out. So how are we accessing memories? But principle four, memories are constantly rewritten. So if we're accessing memories, do we have something to check that memory against so that we're not changing it unknowingly all the time? Now, real quick, before we open the Q&A, I just wanted to to point to hit you guys with something. So I've been working with TES um, for a while now, and we're starting something new. Every fortnight, we're going to release a new video um, called From Theory to Practice, where what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at a new piece of research, either from psychology or neuroscience or education, something meaningful for us analyze it so you don't have to put it in layman's terms and then consider what does this mean for us as teachers. So for instance, this week I just did, um, there was a piece that came out here last year for the government on the impact of cell phone use in schools. So that's it. So I just analyze the literature and tell you what it means and what it means for us as teachers in education. So that should be coming out every fortnight through TES. So hopefully keep an eye out for that. Other than that, I am happy to dive in and start taking some questions with y'all. So brilliant. Thank you, Jared. no worries. Thank you all. Let me stop Fantastic. Sharing. Yeah, really, uh, really interesting. Um, so I, I, I was thought earlier, myself, so you guys uh, are probably still trying to sleep your way through all these games. Yeah, exactly. Well, I thought I thought of myself as a morning person, but um, it turns out I don't even know the al- alphabet. So um, that's that was uh, for in my day. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a few questions coming in. I just um, just one that I thought would be interesting for teachers at the moment um, with so many students, you know, learning at home, probably spending a lot of time on screens using computers more than they're used to. What, what impact does that have on learning? So for example, the medium in which you're delivering information, like we've, we've been on screens here and I've failed to remember, remember anything it seems. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, there's a, a pretty hard fact that once you put a screen up between people, you can assume learning is going to drop. Um, so we do this kind of research all the time where if I do a lecture 
and you're in the room and then another group of people is watching that same lecture at the same time in another room, the people in the live room remember and understand better than the people just next door watching it on a screen. So this isn't, we've, and we've known for decades, this isn't a great medium. It's not impossible. It's just not a great medium for memory and learning. Um, and what I'm gonna point out, I think medium aside, the other issue you have to, or the big issue to consider is one of context. So for the last X amount of weeks and for however many weeks it goes on, kids are gonna be learning from a computer. When we form memories or new learning, we don't get that thing clean. All those memories come tied to the place we do that learning in. So your memories for this event right now aren't just my words. It's whatever the feeling of the chair is against your body, whatever temperature is in the room. If you smell something, if you're hungry, thirsty, all that gets wrapped up and can be used to determine how you access that learning and memory later. So what might happen, and don't be surprised if this does, is when you finally get to make it back into the classroom, you might see about two, three, four days of a slump where kids are just not, things they were doing last week online just fine, all of a sudden they can't do it in your classroom. And a lot of kids might start to get frustrated with that and lose some confidence, be like, oh, I didn't learn anything, what a waste of time. No, nope, it's all still in there. It's just, we've got to somehow recontextualize it over here. Now it's just harder once we move into a classroom in a new context to access memories we didn't make there. So if you see that happening, just know that it's, it's probably, it's not that they didn't understand thing, it's just a switch of mediums and we have to play this context dip that, between the two. And you might just have to spend three, four days simply reviewing things you've already done over the last couple of weeks just to bring it alive in the classroom so you can keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. So if you see that happening with your students, just let them know it's cool, they're fine, don't lose confidence. We just got to play a little bit of a game. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so <laughs> a couple of myths that people have um, flagged up that they want to sort of uh, bust perhaps are, are some people better at remembering things than others or is there is it a lot about technique no yeah so far as we can tell n no everyone's memory system is essentially the same some people have there are variations in the amount of information you can take in so we call those those are your working memory limitations but the ability to form deep memories and once you have deep memories the ability to use them seems to be the same across the board um, so the big differentiator on people who remember things versus people who don't tends to be intrinsic motivation. For instance, I can't tell you anyone's name of anyone I've ever met because I just never cared to remember them. That, that, that doesn't make me a butthead. I just always assume I'll recognize their face and I'll just say, hey, you. Um, <laughs> sorry. But I can remember every minute detail about brain structure. Why? Because I really deeply, that's my passion, passionate thing. So when people say, oh, I've got a good memory or bad memory, no, you don't. We all have the same memory. It's just you care about certain things and you don't care about others. So watch when you memorize those things you care about and don't memorize those things you don't. Cool. Okay. Um, another myth, I guess, that students will fall back on um, in the run-up to exams is sort of cramming. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it effective? Are there better ways to do it than others? Um, or is it better to kind of rely on what you've learned over the course of yeah, the year? Yeah, no. Cramming works uh, an absolute treat for about 24 hours. So if you cram the night before an exam, you'll pass that exam. The problem is, is you won't remember anything a week later. I think that's probably how most of us got through high school and college. Um, it's the same thing with binge watching. Um, most of us will have binged something over the last couple of weeks because of this Corona thing. Watch when your memory for that is almost non-existent. You'll remember about 10 to 20% of it. Uh, you'll, like I remember dragon melted a chair, someone stabbed Khaleesi and I was very disappointed with the whole thing. That's all I got from season eight. Um, <laughs> darn that show. Um, so cramming is effective in the short term, but if you're learning something because you really generally wanna be a part of it and it's your long-term goals and perspective, that's where that space it out with sleep. Um, honest to goodness, this is gonna sound a little weird, but bear with me. In order to learn and really kind of play with new information, your brain has to move into a mode that we're going to call active learning mode. The vast majority of the time, your brain is just an autopilot mode. We're just cruising, having a good old time. To really lock something down, you've got to put your brain into a different mode. When it's in that learning mode, it's sapping energy. It taps into a secondary energy source in your body and it just starts sucking it up. You have a finite amount of that secondary energy source, which means there's only so much you can learn in a day. We tend to say anywhere between 20 minutes and four hours, depending on how much sleep you got the night before. But if we, if we make it nice and say three hours, 
Kids can really only study and learn for three hours a day. They can practice things that they're already good at, or they can work like if they're painters, they can work at making a better painting. But when it comes to taking in and locking down new information, you got about a three hour limit. So you can assume if kids already gone through school, by the time they get to studying, they maybe have an hour. Um, and I've, I've always said, it's the one of the weirdest things. If you do an hour of focused, hard study in a night, you will remember, so let's say you study, you do like 25 minutes of something on, take a break, 25 on, you'll remember 60% more of what you just studied for six months longer than if you studied that same material for five hours while multitasking or for three hours while getting exhausted and reaching your overload point. So there's no reason anyone should have to study anything more than an hour a night. But so long as you keep sleeping and bringing it up the next day, sleep, bring it up the next day, watches those memories just stick with you. You can't get rid of them after that. Wow. Okay. Good technique. <laughs> Great. I wish I'd known that uh, 18 or so years ago. Um, we've got one from YouTube here. Uh, Liz Smith has asked, how does uh, information about memory apply to children with processing difficulties? Um, it's, so here's where you got to see it's the same mechanism. One of the weird things or one of the great things about human beings is, is all the principles stay exactly the same. Once you get kids from different populations, the only thing that changes is the input points. So I always say it's, we all live in the same room. It's just some people go through the door in the front, some go through the door in the back, some go through the window, some come through the chimney. We're all playing the same game. We just have different input points. So for students who have say um, processing difficulties, most of the time you just have to go much slower with them. They'll get there in the end. It's just, they need more time or they need different input. If I've got a blind kid, I can't teach them to read with their eyes. I've got to give them different stimulus to learn from. So they learn to read braille. Um, and one of the cool things, if you think about working memory disorders or low working memory disorders, they're not really just so, this is gonna bear with me. Sorry, I'm gonna try and do it so you can see it on my camera. So if you have a typical working memory limit, whatever the heck that's supposed to be, by the way, there is no, don't worry about it anyway. <laughs> Most kids with typical working memories, they, let's say they progress like this. And let's say I have a kid with a low working memory limit. They're progressing very slowly. And we, we tend to think, okay, so that's your trajectory forever. So this kid will always go up and you're just always going to be here. Sorry, have a good life. Weirdest thing happens. Watch. The kids will be going, this, the normal kid will be going up here. The low working memory is chugging along, chugging along. And then seemingly overnight, and you're banging your head against a wall, man, this kid's moving nowhere, nothing's happening. Seemingly overnight, this kid is going to go, boop, and catch up with everything else. Because what's happening is it takes them longer to form new memories back here. But once you have memories in your brain, you can pull those forward and use those just like anyone else. So whereas it might take me two months to, to lock down enough information that I can start cruising, it might take another kid six months to lock all that down. But once they lock it down, they're moving at the same thinking speed I am past there. So it's when it comes to different student populations, it's, I always say it's never taught, it's useless to talk about the brain. They're not different kids. We're all the same kids. We all follow the same patterns. We might need different stimuli to engage with material. We might need more time or less time, but at the end of the day, the patterns, the rules stay the same. So when you learn the rules, then you can start to adapt them for each situation. So that's why I like the science of learning. That's why I said earlier, it doesn't tell us knowing how we think and learn doesn't tell us how to teach. It tells us how we think and learn. This is where you guys as teachers step up and say, cool, my expertise is I know how to teach. So let me use these to make decisions up here that are going to be best for each context I'm in. Great. I've got a really good question here from Kimberly Rukin. Uh, she's asked, if mistakes aren't corrected and work quickly enough, is there a danger that students will remember the, the wrong information? Yeah, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll fight you for it too. That's mm -hmm. the scary thing. Um, so that's why timely feedback becomes really important, especially for this early memory formation stuff, because you don't catch it early, you're going to have a misconception. The, the cool thing is too is, but it's okay. Even if you've got a, a false memory, you can change that and add a new memory. You never lose the old one. You just now have a dual memory. So uh, we all have this. I still to this day think that if I drop a baseball and a feather, the baseball will drop faster than the feather. And it will because of air. But I also know that no, they will drop at exactly the same speed technically. So you, even though I have this misconception, I've never lost it. I've simply added a truth to it. And now I can see both, which is actually a good thing for us as teachers, because the more, if we just, anytime you learn something new, you lost your old conception. 
we'd never be able to teach anyone. We would be up here trying to pull kids up and we wouldn't understand anything they're saying. But the fact that we can remember how we used to think and we can remember all the stumbles and the wrong ideas we had and the misconceptions we made, we can use those to help recognize when students are making those misconceptions and we can still pull them up. So if you want to cut it off at the pass, get in there early. But if you are too late, you can still teach something new on top of that. You just now you're going to have a dual idea on the kid's head, which isn't a bad thing. It's just a thing. Cool. Okay. Brilliant. Um, I think that's just about all we've got time for today. Sorry, I didn't get to every single question. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, getting involved. Thanks to Jared. That was brilliant. Um, a really, really good one to finish this series on. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you guys. And I'll see you guys on the pages of TES. <laughs> tune in um brilliant yeah if you've um if you've got time at 10 o'clock uh, on this channel we'll be screening a uh, oak academy assembly featuring uh first british woman in space uh whose name i can't remember but um that would be really interesting so tune in for that one but um until then um thank you for joining us and um see you next time cheers bye y'all thanks guys All good.